Now, two of the key pieces of safety equipment Doug and Bob will be relying on will be their high-tech spacesuits. Today's mission will mark the first time these sleek, futuristic-looking suits will be tested in space by humans. The suit's been in development for over five years. We've been iterating on the design with the astronauts as well. One of the unique parts about this suit is that it's a one-piece suit, so everything is connected. The boots, the gloves, the helmet. That way, the crew isn't looking for different parts of their suit. It's all right there for them to quickly get in. The helmet's 3D printed, and it has a visor that can articulate open, so the crew can be in their suit and still open their visors during some parts of the mission. The crew gets into the suit through what we call the inseam zipper. So it's a zipper that runs from the ankle to the ankle, and it runs up along the leg. And then there are additional zippers on the sides of the gloves here so that you can be barehanded uh, up until the very last thing you would do putting on the suit is to put your hands in the gloves and zip up those zippers as well. The Dragon spacesuit is not to do spacewalks. That spacesuit is really to protect you from a depressurization. Pressure suits are a bit cumbersome. Even these suits, albeit, are a lot more comfortable and a lot lighter, a lot easier to get in and out of than the ACES suits we wore in shuttle. In the event that something's wrong with the rest of the capsule's atmosphere, that spacesuit is your little, little capsule that you can go inside and kind of hibernate in to finish out the mission. The outer layer is designed to be flame resistant to protect the crew in the unlikely events of a fire. So the white is a material called PTFE, or more commonly known as Teflon. And the grays are different versions of Nomex, which is a fire resistant material that's often used in firefighter suits, for example. The gloves are also flame resistant, um, but the leather that's used on the fingertips works with the touch displays inside of the capsule. Back behind me there, you can see pad 39A. That's where the Crew Dragon capsule, aboard which Doug and Bob will be headed up to the space station, marking a crucial milestone. Now, it's kind of interesting that a uh, look at this groundbreaking spacecraft that probably only Elon Musk and his crew at SpaceX could have designed. The Dragon spacecraft is really a 21st century spaceship. It's beautiful inside, it's incredibly functional, and it's very, very safe. The Dragon capsule is 16 feet tall, 13 feet in diameter, and can carry up to seven people. The Crew Dragon spacecraft has two types of engines on board. The first are 16 Draco thrusters. Those are small engines that make about 100 pounds of thrust. And those engines are what we're gonna use to maneuver and dock to the International Space Station. And then there are the eight Super Draco engines for a launch escape scenario in an emergency situation, which make thousands of pounds of thrust. My first impression of the inside of Crew Dragon, I was amazed. It's obviously a modern space vehicle. It's a very sleek design inside, very comfortable, uh, flat screens. The seats are actually car racing seats, so the safety factors go up considerably. Check. Some of the great innovations that we've made. We have wonderful touch screens, so you can see everything that's going on in the vehicle. You can get all the data that you need about the vehicle, and you can also control the vehicle all from these touch screens. SpaceX Dragon, we've got two good LEDs. Copy all, Dragon. The interior of the Dragon capsule, it does draw a lot from the Tesla. I think maybe some of the display content, or at least the displays themselves. It's exciting to see, you know, modern components in a spacecraft. The Dragon is almost completely automated, so it should be able to fly the entire flight without us intervening at all. I'm pretty excited to have a chance to fly on a brand new spacecraft. Proud to be a part of a new ship that's going to bring back that mission of taking crews to the space station. We have liftoff of the Falcon 5. What SpaceX has done is developed a rocket that can be reused. Its first stage booster delivers its payload to orbit. Stage separation confirmed. Then it flies back and lands on land or at a ship at sea. I've heard it described as you're standing on the top of the Empire State Building and you drop a pencil off and you have to land the pencil on its eraser on a postage stamp. Ultimately, it's not beyond the realm of physics. And if it's not beyond the realm of physics, there's an engineering way to get it done.
to bring Falcon 9 back to Earth, we've got a navigation system in the first stage. Most first stages don't have that. The Falcon 9 rocket is composed of two main parts, called the first stage and the second stage. What it does after letting go of the second stage is flips itself around, starts its engines back up, and the whole first stage is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and slowly making its way back down for a landing. Currently, the Falcon 9 is designed to be flown 10 times. Each time we do a refurbishment, what we call vehicle maintenance. This is Launch Complex 39A. This building houses and processes Falcon 9s that have landed at our landing pads or have been landed on the drone ships. To refurbish a rocket, they roll into the hangar, we load them into their processing rings, and it's a matter of weeks to process them and get ready for launch. Reusability is incredibly important to space exploration. If every time you had to build a new vehicle, we would be waiting and waiting and waiting for a new rocket to be produced. But when we're able to fly rockets, land them and reuse them, that means we can access space on a weekly basis versus like a monthly or yearly basis. The end goal is obviously to have zero refurbishment, to be able to land and then relaunch like airplanes, to ensure that we're able to access space on a daily basis.